Hey, and welcome back. So this YouTube viewer asked me this perplexing but fascinating question, and that was, did they have invisibility cloaks in World War II? And I thought, no, probably not. But what really is the history of invisibility, and where are we today? So it let me dive down the rabbit hole and discovered some really interesting new approaches to becoming invisible. The first thing I discovered is that most YouTube films are about Harry Potter's cloak of invisibility, which of course is just a green screen cloth, which he wrapped around revealing the set behind him. A very cheap but effective effect in the Harry Potter series. But let's look at the physics of invisibility and what you'd need to really do to disappear. One approach I always have to research is nothing is new. <laughs> Let's look at the history of the concept of making things invisible. And it's really fascinating. Can you believe it actually dates back to the 17th and 18th century where refraction, the bending of light when it passes through a different medium, was first observed and described, both by this guy and this guy. And that led to the concept of things having a refractive index. Air, glass, water are all slightly different, and that's why the pencil bends in a glass of water. Spool forward to the 19th century, and let's go to Imperial College, London where the young H.G. Wells was studying, and he came up with a story using the latest science to write the story, The Invisible Man. In his book, the main character takes a potion which makes his refractive index the same as air, so effectively making him invisible. Um, I don't think that would pass any modern health and safety ideas of chemicals to put inside your body. But it captured the public's imagination and the film of The Invisible Man unwinding his bandages to reveal no head is a classic image of invisibility. So people really wanted to become invisible, but the science and physics behind it, or the chemistry, was very complex. So who do you think really wants to exploit invisibility? The military. And going way back to World War I, they came up with this concept, Dazzle. So Dazzle doesn't make things invisible, but what it does do is confuses our brain and makes the object shape break up to a way that we don't quite know what we're seeing. And we'll return to that in the modern way of camouflage and making things genuinely invisible, which is now possible. So my research amazingly took me back to Imperial College London and Sir John Pendry. John Pendry is a brilliant chap who recently won a major prize in physics. Pendry talks about theory and relies on other people doing experiments but his theories are so interesting and so clear, you need to understand what he's saying about the truth of invisibility. And it all comes back to refractive index and how light waves behave and about the human brain. So John loves the countryside and observed this fantastic natural phenomenon which made him think about how possible it would be to make things invisible. And that's the log in the river. So if you imagine a post or a boulder in a river, water will tend to flow around it and then realign itself on the other side, a bit downstream. So if you looked upstream at the post, it would be invisible because you would see straight lines of reorganized water. And it would only be in the 
portion where the water went around the log or the pebble in the water, that it would be disturbed. So in effect, this realignment on the other side of an object to the same alignment behind it makes the object, the post in the river, invisible to water. So he wrote a paper about bending light around objects. And very interestingly, he didn't start in the visible spectrum. Way back in the day, long before lasers light amplification was invented, Bell and other labs invented microwave amplification masers because it was easier to amplify microwaves because light is such a high frequency. And they managed to do it and then move up a scale into making the lasers we have today. And that's what John has done. No doubt funded by people who really want things to be invisible, and I'll let you guess who they are. So John has been working on radar invisibility using this refraction of microwave radar waves. And he published this paper with a few illustrations of how the device works. I think this picture is very revealing. What you're seeing here are small copper circles with an inner circle. And these produce a magnetic field which can disrupt radar energy, interestingly, on carbon fiber or composite, or in fact, any substrate. You can lay these circles, these inner and outer circles, energize them, and make an aircraft, I'm guessing, totally invisible. And this is how they work. Because they're electronic and every single circle can be controlled separately, you can actually produce this log in the river effect where light or radar energy in this case bends around the aircraft and reforms exactly the same in front of it as it was behind it, making the object in the middle invisible. And I'm guessing, because he doesn't say, but we have a picture of the device that this is currently being used in stealth aircraft. And that was just a first step, possibly a few years ago. So he turned his mind brilliantly to how you could up the game and make visible wavelength wrap around things to make things become invisible. Amazingly, it goes back to material science. And in fact, it picks up on his fellow Imperial College person, H.G. Wells, who described the concept, but not the process. So Pendry wanted to work out how to actually bend light. So the first thing he did was actually to make a better lens. It turns out that the best optical glass you can get in a lens doesn't actually focus light to beyond, below its own wavelength. So you hit this barrier where things that are really tiny just can't be resolved. And he cracked it. The Sir John Pendry light wavelength lens earned him his prize in physics. And using that research, he realized that there is a way to make things invisible. And he describes it in one word. And the word is metamaterials. So what exactly is a metamaterial? Well, it's a man-made, not naturally occurring material that can be engineered chemically or mechanically to have properties that don't exist in nature. Some of the manipulation would need to be at the nanoscale, but in some cases they could be at the millimeter scale. They're just things that don't naturally exist. And that gets me onto a really important point. So you've probably seen on the interweb and YouTube this, and this is a brilliant guy who's made the lenticular lens system so advanced that you can hide behind it as a shield. 
and it makes the person hiding behind the shield apparently semi-invisible. And that semi is my point. On his way to work, Sir John Pendry walks through Kensington Gardens, famous for this, the statue of Peter Pan. And you'll remember in the wonderful Peter Pan book that Peter loses his shadow. And the whole book is his quest to get his shadow back. And eventually at the end of the book, Wendy gets it back and sews it onto Peter, making him a real person, bringing him back into the real world. And I love how stories, how fiction, how science fiction can trigger a science brain to think, Oh, that's really interesting. So as Sir John Pendry walked past the Peter Pan statue, he realized that even if it was invisible, it would still have a shadow and that wouldn't work. Sir John's also a keen photographer and he very much focuses on butterfly photography, which is very interesting because as you know, blue butterflies aren't actually blue. They have nanostructures that absorb all the wavelengths of light and reflect the blue color. If you looked at them under a microscope, they would be a dull brown color, but from a distance or with a camera lens, butterflies appear blue. So Pendry took a picture of the Peter Pan statue in Kensington Gardens and using Photoshop, he erased the shadow of the statue 10, 20, 50 or 100 percent. And he noticed something really interesting. What he spotted was you didn't have to get rid of the shadow completely. The human brain, our brain, fails at about 50% of disruption. Everything we see, we guess what it is. We see a brick with a corner and we say house. No, it's actually some ceramics in a terracotta color, but we are very good at jumping the next step to actually recognize what the object really is. So, if you can mess around with the human brain and make the object ambiguous, it doesn't compute and we don't really know what we're looking at. And that's exactly what they did with the dazzle boats. It just didn't compute. When you look through a submarine periscope at this wavy line going across the horizon, you ignored it because your brain didn't say boat. Is visible light invisibility possible? And the answer is yes. A team at Duke University have taken the basic research by Sir John Pendry and made it possible. This complex circular copper maze lets you put an object in the middle and it becomes invisible. First of all, to microwave energy, but soon with optics. It's just a matter of time, or maybe as you and I know, we're not being told the whole truth, but the groundwork and the concept of meta materials altering the refractive index of an object to the same as air, H.G. Wells, thank you, has been worked out. Who's actually building it? The truth is out there. Well, thanks for watching and hopefully you enjoyed that. I certainly enjoyed researching it for you. Let me explain a bit about why I'm having a problem with YouTube and why Patreon is really working out much better. For a start, Patreon, I don't have to fulfill the YouTube advertiser algorithms. I just don't place adverts. So seeing the films advertising free is fantastic. Plus, YouTube really don't like this channel. You notice that most of my films get a couple of thousand views, which adds up to about 
two dollars. Patreon is much better for me. I can connect with you, my greatest fans. We can discuss new films, no adverts, and it's just a great science community. Plus, you get a free t-shirt if you sign up at a slightly higher level. So if you want to support independent filmmaking, you enjoy this type of research that I do for you, please consider spending a dollar a month. It really helps me make these films. Thank you.